you all again for joining. Welcome. Um, my name's Dr. Mary Ann Gale. I'm a, um, the Director of Population and Community Health in South Eastern Sydney Local Health District. And um, hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, so welcome this morning to the launch of the called Assist Resources. Um, I think it's a terrific opportunity to have everybody here um, to um, recognise the importance of these resources. And I think as well, really recognise the, um, the great diversity that we have in our community and the role of the health system in um, supporting our diverse communities um, as they interact with our services. And I think tools like Call Assist are incredibly important um, for improving the experience of our patients from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds and for enabling our services to provide healthcare that is of the highest quality and that is both clinically safe as well as uh, culturally safe. So thank you all again for your interest um, and your enthusiasm and um, for joining us this morning for the launch. Before we go further, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we're all meeting on today from our various locations and we pay our respects to Elders past, present, um, emerging and any Aboriginal people who are with us today on the call. Um, as we go forward, we've got um, some great speakers um, to give us some background about the resources um, and then we're very glad to have um, Ms. Tish Bruce, um, Executive Director from Health and Social Policy from the Ministry of Health to launch the tools um, for us. Um, so if people have questions as we go along, we just ask you to pop them in the chat function. As many of you I can see already utilizing. So if you do have questions, we'll keep an eye on that Q&A and um, sorry, not the Q&A, the chat. Oh no, sorry. I think it is the Q&A, disregard me. q and I'm telling you the wrong thing. So any questions, please put it in the Q&A and we'll keep an eye on that and raise the questions. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Associate Professor Ben Harris-Roxas. And Ben is the Director of the Southeastern Sydney Research Collaboration Hub, also known as SEARCH, um, at the Centre for Primary Healthcare and Equity at UNSW. And today he will be presenting on research that's co-sponsored by Southeastern Sydney Local Health District Priority Populations Unit and the Ministry of Health. Um, on the use of translation apps in clinical care in New South Wales. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, Ben. Thanks very much, Marianne. And, um, and I should acknowledge I'm also part of um, population and community health within Southeastern Sydney LHD. Um, and we're fortunate to have that uh, connection between the two organisations. So hopefully you'll be seeing some slides from me on screen now. Yes. Yes, people can see. Okay. Um, so uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm on Bedigal land today from in the Eora Nation and I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present as well and extend my respect genuinely to Aboriginal people who are here today. Um, as Marianne mentioned, I'm here to talk about some work that was taken undertaken in conjunction with uh, South East Sydney LHD and the Ministry along with four other LHDs participating in the, the research, um, which was looking at the use of translation apps. And I'd like to acknowledge my terrific collaborators and co-authors co who are listed here. Um, so the issue that drove our interests in this area are twofold. One is that the use of translation apps and websites in healthcare settings um, seems to be increasing. And the second part is that machine translation might not be accurate for a range of health information and also for a range of languages and settings. Um, it's not <clears throat> equal in the way it's um, relevant or the way it works. There have been several uh, examples of people actually using translation apps within clinical contexts context that have led to adverse outcomes. So I think it's really important to start by noting the issues we're discussing aren't hypothetical. They really matter to people and to their clinical care. So we're seeing an explosion of interest really about the use of apps to communicate in virtually all settings, but particularly across health and social services. 
This is actually a print ad promoting the use of Google Translate as something that people can and should be using in times of crisis. And if we think about how that incurs within our healthcare settings, we can see that there's going to be a lot of interest um, in, in and also pressure to use, I think, translation apps. Um, so how is this actually playing out in the settings in which we work? So here's an example. Uh, apologies if you've seen this before. I love to show this to people about how some information on how to prepare for a colonoscopy in English has been translated into Nepali and then translated back again. <clears throat> so we might be looking at some compounding errors because of the translation back and forth, but you get a sense of what the translation's like from looking at the, uh, the final column. Um, at one level, you see that the word sort of makes sense, but in aggregate, it's been totally stripped of its contextual meaning before your colonoscopy you need to drink some fluid that will open your eyes and so on. But believe it or not, this is actually heaps better than the, uh, because I just ran it recently. This is what it looked like a year ago, which makes absolutely no sense. So I think this illustrates that the neural networks that sit behind these translation apps aren't static, they're improving and the content of these translations will change. So the translation from a year ago is clearly worse, but we can't assume the words and the phrases used will use standard terminology, which is really important for communicating health information. So what does this mean in practice for health services? We uh, found that there's a potential range of uses for machine translation apps during our early investigation stage. So during you know one-on-one -on -one clinical interactions for translating written information, for translating general information. And we also found that a number of websites with health information are actually being translated into uh, other languages using machine translations, i.e translation websites or apps rather than interpreters. But it remained unclear um, who's initiating the use of translation apps and websites and under what circumstances. So is it the healthcare provider? Is it the patient or the consumer? Is it their family members or, or carers? So that's what drove a lot of our interest. So I'll just briefly touch on the context because most of the work in this area is focused on the accuracy of these uh, neural network translation uh, that, that's un underpin these translations. There's been a little bit of descriptive work done looking at the types of apps that already exist, but there's been less work done on uh, what is the actual nature and extent of use and how is this playing out in health and, and even social services. In 2017, a survey was done by Multicultural Health within Southeast Sydney LHD focusing primarily on what the issues were around um, access to interpreters and use of interpreters. But it included one question about the use of translation apps. And I guess surprisingly back then, it found that 18% of respondents had used apps. So these findings and other um, consultations that were happening at the time, I think inform the update to the policy directive by the ministry that makes it clear it's really not acceptable to use machine translation in healthcare contexts. So we thought, okay, what we really need to get a handle on is what is the nature and the extent of translation uh, app use in state funded healthcare services in, in New South Wales. So we did two things. We did a survey of staff across five local health districts and semi structured interviews with people who'd use translation apps who agreed. We had just over 1500 respondents from five districts. Um, we did have a low response rate overall of everyone it was sent to across those districts of, of 2%. So it's worth noting though, that we had good representation across a range of clinical streams and clinical areas. In terms of the qualitative interviews, we, uh, we interviewed 24 people, again, from across the five districts and that encompassed a range of professional groups. So what we found from the survey, really the headline was that a third of people reported that they'd used a translation app in a clinical encounter. And of those, three quarters had used a translation app within the past year and around 60% in the past three months. What was really interesting for me and something I hadn't really anticipated was that clinicians were actually the ones um, who reported initiating use in about two thirds of cases. I, th I think I'd probably had a bit of an unconscious assumption that it might be consumers or family members initiating use. And 40% had used an app after a request for a professional interpreter had been made. But that then means that almost 60% didn't request an interpreter before using the app. So who tended to be the users? We found that users were significantly young, likely, more likely to be younger. 
they tended to be male, which was interesting given that 80% of our sample was actually female. Um, they tended to be less experienced. So use was higher amongst people who'd worked in um, the New South Wales health system for less than 10 years. And they tended to be clinical staff. So around 40% of clinical staff had used apps compared to only 16% of non-clinical staff. And we need to keep in mind that non-clinical staff can also include people um, who have patient and client contact as well. So admin or ward staff, for example. Um, in terms of professional groups, we found that use was highest amongst the medical workforce, followed by nursing and midwifery with perhaps, um, as you'll see, lower rates amongst allied health and administration roles. Um, in terms of um, in terms of uh, where people reported using the apps in terms of their work setting, it was highest amongst people working in emergency departments and inpatient settings and comparatively less use in outpatient settings and community um, settings, which was again interesting because I think I perhaps unconsciously assumed there might be more use outside uh, hospital settings. In terms of perceptions of app use, 93% rated tra translation apps as useful or very useful. So while they're seen as useful, just under 60% said that the risk of misinterpretation was low or none. And um, however, only a third rated the translation as accurate or very accurate. So there's some interesting contrasts in those responses. Apps were seen as useful by almost all the sample, but um, accurate by only a, around a third of people and having some risk of misinterpretation was recognised by about 40% of respondents. So this leads to one of the major concepts that we found that came out of our analysis of the qual interviews. People spoke about weighing up these risks of inaccuracy in time. And here's a quote that demonstrates that. Um, I won't read out all the quotes, you can take a look at them, but I think they illustrate some of these themes. Here's another quote that I think alludes to the same thing. Um, you know, this person said that they were in bed and they couldn't necessarily, uh, weren't necessarily able or confident that they could get a face-to-face -face Thai interpreter, so they thought the use would be okay. Um, here's another, uh, you know, important quote <clears throat> that um, I think this is an issue, uh, sorry, um, jumped a slide. Um, so again, these issues of uh, weighing things up, um, this is an important issue that, you know, interpreters routinely encounter. In some languages, there's not a direct translation for words, particularly for medical and technical terms. So interpreters amongst themselves often develop and share terminology um, in an effort to come up with standardised translations and terminology and have a shared lexicon, a shared set of understandings. And so here's a final quote is that um, you know, again, about this weighing up risks, I don't think uh, non-human ways of doing it are good enough at present, you know, and that really comes down to a lot of the tensions and challenges that people are dealing with in, in using these apps. So I won't go into other qualitative findings in depth, but I did just want to highlight some of the concepts. People spoke about that trade-offs also between perceptions of access to interpreter services and efficiency and cost. Um, there were a lot of interesting sort of ideas about patient-centered communication and some conflicting ideas. Some people described using apps as responding to needs while others said apps are meeting healthcare workers needs more than patients. And there was a recognition also that communication has the same purpose or content, um, but there might be occasions, uh, you know, doesn't always have the same content or, you know, severity or implications. So, you know, sometimes simple communication makes a difference but doesn't warrant the use of an interpreter. So what does this mean? I think, you know, use appears to be somewhat widespread. Um, in most cases, it seems to be clinicians initiating use. And use may be growing, but we need to be careful about over-interpreting that from that 2017 um, survey that found 18% of participants in a somewhat similar sample increased to more than 35%. Um, in, in, in this follow-up survey. And if that's the case, use may, may be spreading quite rapidly. Um, and there's also an implied contradiction, as I mentioned, between 
the risks being seen as low, but recognition that the translations aren't necessarily terribly accurate. So people are making those trade-offs. Um, they might be doing it on the fly and not even be particularly conscious they're doing it. Um, a significant limitation that I do want to emphasize is we did have a low response rate. And I think the other thing is um, that we need to recognize is that people may have been somewhat self-censoring because they may have recognized that the policy directive said the use of translate, machine translation isn't really permissible. So in terms of what remains unknown, I think is there variability in other settings outside New South Wales health um, services? So for example, aged care, NDIS providers, primary health care. Um, it's also really important to have uh, an understanding, and this is work I'm hoping to take forward, about what are the consumers and patients' um, perce uh, perceptions about this as well. And uh, would there be benefits from using a translation app that was raised based around phrase banks or standard lexicons instead? And could we realise many of the same benefits with fewer risks? And I think this is where the exciting gap that Call Assist addresses. And um, I'd just like to um, mention that, you know, what's at stake is really, you know, potentially clinical safety is a thing that we need to be concerned about, as well as just failing to make the differences in consumers, families, patients' lives that we could and should be making as clinical services. And there is this issue about fundamental dignity and the need to be understood. Um, as, as humans and as consumers. So that involves being heard and respected. And it's really a fundamental driver for all of us. And it, it's a really important part of how we work as health services. And then if we uncritically embrace, you know, machine translation, um, we can understand, uh, undermine a lot of that human connection. So I'd like to acknowledge, um, just in closing, the, the funders um, who really catalyzed and uh, from the ministry and um, Sesslid, who really catalyzed this work, and uh, our terrific site investigators and collaborators from across um, those five LHDs as well. So, and if you're interested, the um, these slides, which I'm conscious I've gone through fairly quickly, are available at that URL as well. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Ben. Okay, I think that was a um, a great overview um, of of many of the important. Um, issues and I think really highlights, um, I think, the importance of the tool that's been developed in Call Assist. So thank you for that. Um, okay, I'd now, now like to introduce Miss Lisa Woodland. Um, and Lisa is the Director of the New South Wales Multicultural Health Communication Service, and also the Director of the Priority Populations Unit in Southeastern Sydney Local Health District. And Lisa is going to give us an overview of the Call Assist app. And so over to you, Lisa. I know that your connection has not been the greatest, but um, hopefully we won't have any issues. So over to you, Lisa, thanks. Good morning, everyone. And um, thank you, Marianne, for that introduction. And to Ben for the um, fabulous overview of the use of translations app in the health sector. Um, my apologies also uh, for all of our technical uh, problems today. Um, I think that we're all sorted now, so um, I'll move through my slides fairly quickly. Um, I would like to uh, just let you know that I'm um, joining the meeting from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend that respect to Aboriginal colleagues and colleagues from migrant and refugee um, communities um, that are joining us today. So the important research on the use of translation apps has highlighted the challenges for health staff in communicating with some of the members um, of our community and the approaches that some staff have, um, have taken in utilising um, their, their ingenuity, if you like, to address uh, some of the language barriers. Um, however, we do know that translation apps are not always accurate and due to these inaccuracies may in fact be counterproductive to high quality patient centred care. And uh, as many of you would be aware, their use is not supported by the New South Wales Health Policy on Standard Procedures for Working with Healthcare Interpreters. 
So it's been very um, exciting to be working with the working group from across New South Wales and Western Health Victoria and CSIRO to implement the use of their award-winning um, app called Assist into New South Wales. So Call Assist has been developed by Western Health and CSRO to support health staff, particularly nursing and allied health professionals, to communicate with patients with low English proficiency in low risk and basic care interactions. We'll just move to the next slide. Um, the app can be used on smartphones and tablet um, devices and feature over 250 phrases that have been translated by professional translators. So they don't rely on machine-based or automated translation. So therefore the accuracy of the content is reliable. The content has been developed by experienced clinicians and includes appropriate prompts to involve professional interpreters when necessary. The content was designed by clinicians and so therefore the app is very intuitive and very easy to use. The content is divided into several subject areas, um, nursing as well as several allied health disciplines, dietetics, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, podiatry speech, and speech pathology. And it also includes some basic screenings, um, basic screening questions related to COVID-19. Um, the Call Assist is available in 10 languages. I'll let you read those for yourself as well as English. So let's move to the next slide. The content's also supported by images, video and audio recordings voiced by professional interpreters. So moving to the next slide. So in order to support the implementation of Call Assist in New South Wales, the Health and Social Policy Branch has generously funded Multicultural Health Communication Service to develop some resources for local health districts and specialty health networks to use to promote and assist staff with the use of the app. The first resource, which we'll see in a little while, is a video resource. Um, it has an introduction by Jackie Cross, the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer for New South Wales and features two scenarios demonstrating how call assist can be used in a clinical context. And our thanks to colleagues who appear in this video. The video resource also includes an endorsement by Vesna Travoya from Sydney Healthcare Interpreter Service, recognising that the app is a useful tool to supplement professional interpreters and provides a way for staff to interact with patients in low risk situations when the use of healthcare interpreters is not practical. We also have two fact sheets. One is a general overview and the other is provides more technical information on installing and updating the app on tablets and smartphones. So all of these resources are now available at the Multicultural Health Communication Service website. And there's also an email address for further inquiries. So just in finishing, I would like to thank um, Health and Social Policy Branch for funding these resources and Western Health Victoria and CSIRO for their support and guidance in this project. Um, we'll just move to the next slide as well. I'd also like to thank the uh, members of the Working Party across New South Wales that have been involved in the development of these resources. And as you can see, there's been many people involved and, and um, they've really helped us produce some fabulous things. So I'll finish there. Um, thank you very much and, and back to you, Mary Ann. Wonderful, thank you, Lisa. Um, uh, I think it's clear it's such a valuable tool and obviously a lot of hard work um, from many people um, over the years, um, but it seems like an extremely useful thing and will really, I think, Im improve the experience of um, uh, patients uh, in our hospitals who speak a language um, other than English. Um, okay, so I'm going to now introduce Ms. Tish Bruce, who's the Executive Director of the Health and Social Policy Branch of the New South Wales Ministry of Health. Um, and Tish has kindly agreed to launch the resources um, that her branch has very kindly um, supported um, 
uh, and resourced. Um, and we're very thankful to Tish for her support um, for this. So over to you, Tish, thank you. Thanks, Marianne, and uh, welcome everybody. And it's fantastic to have you online. And I think um, this type of launching is a testament to our moving into our new way of working that we can engage really broadly across um, the state and with key stakeholders through our platforms for that. So I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today, um, recognising that there's many lands that we're all on. And for me, also I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So there are many of us uh, on, on that land today. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person who's joining us today and acknowledge people from migrant and refugee backgrounds. Um, thank you, Ben and Lisa, for your presentations. And um, I haven't heard some of the, the background work into that, so I was really interested to see um, some of that data, Ben. Thank you for that. And, and Lisa, for recognising the work that, that um, it takes to actually get these pieces um, of activity up and why we're doing it. Um, and so, I, you know, I think um, we all are working to deliver high quality patient centred care to people of across New South Wales, people in our admitted setting, in our outpatients and our community settings. And this is through so many of the activities do, we're doing is, is our top priority. And Ben, I was reflecting as you were talking about that um, the, the surveys found that it was often generated by clinicians rather than by um, clients themselves, the use of um, translation tools. And I think that actually reflects people's desire to give high quality care and really engage with their, their patients. And I think what we're doing today is being able to do that in a um, safe and meaningful way and be confident about the accuracy of that, but give it to people with tools that, that they are confident that, that the, the state is behind them and the systems are there to go. It's the right way of, of communicating. I think we know, you know, we know that a lot of people access our services um, from, from uh, backgrounds where English is not their primary language. The ABS survey in 2016 identified that 25% of residents speak a language other than English at home, and of them, 4.5% speak only their, well, not only their home language, don't speak English at all, or at all well, don't have confidence in it. And I think when we add that layer to them coming into hospital or being um, uh, going through a healthcare environment, it adds additional pressures to what is people's second or sometimes third and fourth language. So the need to be able to provide confident communications with them that's safe um, is really important in these environments. In New South Wales, we're incredibly fortunate about the fantastic um, healthcare interpreter service that we have. Um, and, and I think we need to constantly recognise and value that an enormous and valuable service that we have. But with 25% of our population not speaking English at home and the huge volume of healthcare interactions we have, it's not always possible or practical to have a professional healthcare interpreter work with us with all those interactions with clients and patients um, and with their families. So by being able to do this sort of work, it really adds to it. As Lisa um, pointed out for us, the Call Assist app is an award-winning communications tool that assists in providing care for patients for call backgrounds with low English proficiency and in those low risk and basic care environments. And it's um, been interesting to talk with the gang. I haven't had a chance to do that. I know it's been framed around nursing and allied health, but I actually, as I was looking through it, I thought this is as important for, for our medicos to be able to do as well, um, that all of our professions need to have that ability to have those quick, safe, regular communications. And, and I, it's got a predominance in there for nursing and allied health, but I think we shouldn't limit our, our reference to, to all people being able to take value from this resource. Um, Health and Social Policy is incredibly um, pleased to have partnered with New South Wales Multicultural Health Communications Service to develop these training and promotional materials um, and to be able to do that in a way that it, it's available for all people across the state um, in our public health systems, but probably beyond that as well. So it's actually a privilege for us to join you in this partnership. 
I also would like to thank the Cold Assist Working Party, um, who've been a fantastic collaborative team working on this project, and also recognise the teams at Western Health Victoria and the CSIRO who did the work to actually develop this important app and, and their foresight to, to make it available for use for health professionals across Australia. Um, and then being able to talk in our New South Wales language makes, makes the confidence that it's right for us. So the resources are launched today and it will be available on the Multicultural Health Communication Service website. And that includes a video and some fact sheets. And I think our wonderful tech team uh, or team who are managing the tech are going to um, set up the video so we can watch it now. Is that right? The nurses, midwives and allied health staff caring for patients in clinical environments, providing safe, high-quality, person-centred care is our top priority. Call Assist is a simple and innovative communication app that can assist in improving interactions with patients from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds with low English proficiency. The award-winning app was developed by Western Health in Victoria in partnership with the CSIRO and includes more than 250 commonly used phrases that are used in basic care interactions, including COVID-19 screening questions. They're all translated into 10 languages plus English. And it means that nurses, midwives and allied health staff can more clearly communicate with patients in our multicultural society. And because Call Assist was designed by people who actually use it, including patients, the app is intuitive and it's easy to use. The app doesn't replace the need for a professional interpreter. It's designed to be used in times when staff need to communicate with patients in simple, basic care interactions. It's in these situations that the app can be really useful and importantly, improve a patient's overall experience of their care. When I want to organise an appointment and an interpreter is not available, the app allows me to introduce myself and ask some basic questions. For basic assessment questions that require a yes or no response, the patient can point to the answer. The app is also supported by audio, so the patient can hear the question if they can't read or if they have visual concerns. There are also pictures the patient can point to to communicate their response. It's that simple. There is a lot of helpful content in the nursing modules, such as letting a patient know about simple procedures like taking their blood pressure or temperature. The more familiar I am with the app, the easier it is to use. Sometimes you need a quick response such as, do you have pain? Or how much pain do you have? Of course, we would call for an interpreter to help understand the situation in more detail. But the app allows us to get more timely and accurate information from patients, which means we're being more responsive to their needs, and that's a good thing. With 25% of people in New South Wales speaking a language other than English at home, Healthcare interpreter staff are constantly busy. If there are low risk situations like, do you need a glass of water? Or do you wear dentures? Or even please stand up? Situations where a quick response is needed, then using cold assist is appropriate. It means the interpreter service are freed up to be involved in more complex conversations. The phrases have been translated by professional translators and voiced by professional interpreters, so they are culturally appropriate and can't be misunderstood. The app is free, available on iPad, iPhone and Android devices, and can be downloaded from the App Store or Google Play. It's really that easy.
So thank you for our wonderful guys who got the video up. Um, I think that's a great video too. I, I really loved watching it when I saw it the first time. It just made it so quickly clear about what it can do and how it can be used. Um, and I think it's called Assist app is, it shows that it is easy to use, that it's there for the people. Um, and I think it really will enhance greatly the communication um, for those basic interactions with patients and their families. I have a feel that it will help people, both clinicians and consumers, feel safer and more able to be heard because that information, those, those small day-to-day -day things are so important to actually feeling that, that the system is holding you and that they, that they know what's important to you. I also really loved the, the design of it that uses the combination of text, visuals, audio, picture cues, all of that. So we're trying to um, give the best opportunity for people to engage in the communications and be partners with us in their care. Um, I noted that there was a question about updating the policy that we've got in the, the state policy to reflect the existence of the app. So we'll take that away um, as, as a query from the group. I haven't been able to keep up with the other question, but I'm sure Marianne has. Um, but on that note, just with the fantastic applause to the people who designed and developed and the people who've worked in New South Wales to make this real for us here, I, with great pleasure, I am proud to um, launch the Call to Assist app for New South Wales on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tish. Um, okay, so I noticed that before the team had popped up um, the fact sheets as well, so um, hopefully that gave people a glance of uh, what that looks like. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, they're all available on the Multicultural Health Communication Service um, website. So I think there you go. Um, that's what the website looks like and um, the fact sheets. So I'd encourage everyone on the line to download the app as, as I just did as well, um, to familiarise yourself with it um, and to recommend it to your, to your colleagues and also to have a look at the website and the fact sheet and disseminate those um, through your networks. I think, you know, it's, it's a very um, thoughtfully designed tool um, and I think the idea of having um, voices and visual images. So there's so much work that's gone into it. And I guess as a system, we'd really like to see that utilized broadly. Um, okay, so on that note, that brings us to the end um, of this session. I do note there were a number of questions um, that have come through um, and a number of them are asking about the addition of other languages. And I just wondered, Lisa, did you want to comment on any current plans or opportunities to expand into other languages? Um, thanks very much, um, Marianne. It is something that we are having ongoing discussions with, um, both with uh, Ministry of Health, Western Health and CSIRO. Um, I think that the people who have used the tool have really recognised that it's got enormous potential. Uh, so we are keen to um, explore the use of other languages. Um, and we've also had a lot of interest in exploring it into other settings, such as maternity. So that's all work that's um, being discussed at the moment. Um, what we thought was most important at this stage was to get the tool as it is out there into the hands of uh, clinicians to support that communication. With, um, with their patients with low English proficiency. And we'll be certainly doing our best to, um, you know, to work towards an expansion of the tool in the future, knowing how valuable and um, uh, interested uh, both clinicians and, and, and patients are in the tool. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and another question that we've got is around the use of devices and um, you know, who would have the app? Um, and, um, and I think, Joe, you might have a few words to say on that one. Um, I'll, oh, I'll Lisa, answer. sorry. I'm fooled by the title. Joe means Lisa. Yes. No, that's right. Lisa. I'm sorry. Um, technical details, yes. you know, I just have to jump into somebody else's screen. Um, so I, I guess um, I haven't been able to sort of monitor the questions directly, but what I would say is that the, um, the, this communication tool is clinician-led. Um, it's intended to be um, held by the clinician at all times. 
um, and there's a number of um, sort of safety issues and um, uh, infection control issues that we've um, uh, pointed to in the fact sheets. Um, so I'm not sure if that exactly answers the question um, that's been asked. Um, but certainly, um, you know, we know that it has been used in lots of settings very safely. Um, but yes, it's a clinician led tool and a clinician head held tool um, in our facilities. Thanks, Lisa. And I think we've got time maybe just for one more question. Um, I see one there from Erin in um, Central Coast. And Erin's um, question is just around where do they provide feedback to? Because there's some tips around being able to manage the volume or potentially slow down the speech. Um, where, where does any feedback go if people have um, suggestions about improving the app? So uh, on our website, we do have an email address so if people have any questions, they're welcome to email us. Um, if they have any tips, that would be really helpful to email those as well. Um, certainly we'll keep updating the resources and in response, uh, we will we'll probably set up a frequently asked questions um, component of, of the web page uh, so that we can share that information across New South Wales. Wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. And, um, I think on that note, we're um, pretty much at time. And I just wanted to say a big thank you to, to everybody. I think we've got over 120 people who've joined us and um, particularly you're to be commended on your patience and sticking with us for the 15 minutes or so that we had to sort out the technology. Um, but thank you very much everybody for your interest in this area, your passion about it. And, um, you know, we see you as being a, a great, um, audience and opportunity to disseminate um, this great tool through your networks to, to make sure we can really um, optimise um, all the benefits that we see that it could bring. So again, thank you all very much for joining. A big thank you to Lisa and the team for all their work in getting it to this point, as well as the many other people who were involved in creating the app. A big thank you to Ben for your presentation, um, to you Tish um, for launching and joining us today and all the support from the Ministry of Health. Um, so on that note, thank you all. I wish you a, a, a very lovely day. Hopefully you don't stay, uh, don't get wet. It's a bit not so good outside, but um, thank you again for joining. Uh, have a lovely day. Bye-bye.